This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Adventure 1. A Scandal in Bohemia. Sections 1 through 3. Section 1. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In her eyes, she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen, but as a lover he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passions, save with a jibe and a sneer. They were admirable things for the observer, excellent for drawing the veil from men's motives and actions. But for the trained reasoner to admit such intrusions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw a doubt on all his mental results. Grit in a sensitive instrument, or a crack in one of his own high-powered lenses, would not be more disturbing than a strong emotion in a nature such as his. And yet, there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler, of dubious and questionable memory. I have seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness and the home-centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment were sufficient to absorb all my attentions, while Holmes, who loathed every form of society with his whole bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street. Buried among his old books and altering from week to week between cocaine and ambition, the drowsiness of the drug and the fierce energy of his own keen nature, he was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime, and occupied his immense faculties and extraordinary powers of observation in following out these clues, and clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. From time to time I heard some vague account of his doings, of his summons to Odessa, in the case of the Trepoff murder, of his clearing up of the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers at Tricomale, and finally of the mission which he had accomplished so delicately and successfully for the reigning family of Holland. Beyond these signs of his activity, however, which I merely shared with all the readers of the daily press, I knew little of my former friend and companion. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I had now returned to civil practice, when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my woeing, and with the dark incidents of the Stotty in Scarlet, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit, and even as I looked up I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, 
who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner, told their own story. He was at work again. He had risen out of his drug-created dreams and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber, which had formerly been in part my own. His manner was not effusive. It seldom was, but he was glad, I think, to see me. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved me an armchair, threw across his case of cigars, and indicated a spirit case and a gasogene in the corner. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in his singular, introspective fashion. Wedlock suits you, he remarked. I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven, I answered. Indeed, I should have thought a little more, just a trifle more, I fancy, Watson. And in practice again, I observed, you did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you have been getting yourself very wet lately, and that you have a most clumsy and careless servant girl? My dear Holmes, said I, this is too much. You would certainly have been burned had you lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had a country walk on Thursday, and came home in a dreadful mess, but as I have changed my clothes, I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice. But there again I fail to see how you work it out. He chuckled to himself, and rubbed his long, nervous hands together. It is simplicity itself, said he. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is scorched by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they have been caused by someone who has very careless scraped around the edges of the soles in order to remove crusted mud from it. Hence, you see my double deduction, that you have been out in vile weather, and that you have a particularly malignant boot-slitting specimen of the London Slave. As to your practice, if a gentleman walks into my room smelling of iodine, with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger, and a budge on the right side of his top hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope. I must be dull indeed if I did not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. I could not help laughing at the ease with which he examined his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself, though at each successive instance of your reasoning I am baffled until you explain your process, and yet I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so, he answered, lighting a cigarette and throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room? Frequently. How often? Well, some hundred of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed, and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now I know that there are seventeen steps, because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, and since you have been good enough to chronicle one or two of my trifling experiences, you may be interested in this. He threw over a sheet of thick, pink-tinted notepaper, which had been lying upon the table. It came by the last post, said he. Read it aloud. The note was undated and without either signature or address. There will call upon you tonight, 
At a quarter to eight o'clock, it said, a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment, your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe, have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you will have from all quarters received. But in your chamber, then at that hour, and do not take it amiss, if your visitor wears a mask. This is indeed a mystery, I remarked. What do you imagine that it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories, instead of theories to suit facts. But the note itself, what do you deduce from it? I certainly examined the writing and the paper upon which it was written. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do, I remarked, endeavoring to imitate my companion's process. Such paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. It is peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar, that is the very word, said Holmes. It is not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. I did so, and saw a large E with a small G, a P, and a large G with a small T woven into the texture of the paper. What do you make of that? asked Holmes. The name of the maker, no doubt, or his monogram, rather. Not at all. The G with a small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is German for company. It is a customary contraction like our CO. P, of course, stands for paper. Now for the EG. Let us glance at our continual gazetteer. He took down a heavy brown volume from his shelves. Eglo, eglots. Here we are. Egria. It is in a German speaking country in Bohemia not far from Carlsbad, remarkably as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. Ha ha, my boy, what do you make of that? His eyes sparkled, and he sent up a great blue triumphant cloud from his cigarette. The paper was made in Bohemia, I said. Precisely. And the man who wrote the note is a German. Do you note the particular contraction of the sentence? This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or Russian could not have written that. It is the German who is so uncounterous to his verbs. It only remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German, who writes upon bohemian paper and prefers wearing a mask to showing his face. And here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve all our doubts. As he spoke, there was the sharp sound of horse's hoofs, and the grating wheels against the curb, followed by a sharp pull at the bell. Holmes whistled. A pair by the sound, said he. Yes, he continued, glancing out of the window. A nice little brogman, and a pair of beauties, a hundred and fifty guineas apiece. There's money in this case, Watson, if there is nothing else. I think that I had better go, Holmes. Not a bit, Doctor. Stay where you are. I am lost without my Boswell, and that promises to be interesting. It would be a pity to miss it. But your client, never mind him. I may want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in that armchair, doctor, and give us your best attention. A slow and heavy step, which had been heard upon the stairs, and in the passage paused immediately outside the door. Then there was a loud and authoritative tap. Come in, said Holmes. A man entered who could hardly have been less than six feet six inches in height, with the chest and limbers of a Hercules. His dress 
was rich with a richness which would in england be looked upon as akin to bad taste heavy bands of astrakhan were slashed across the sleeves and fronts of his double-breasted coat while the deep blue coat which was thrown over his shoulders was lined with flame-colored silk and secured at the neck with a brooch which consisted of a single flaming barrel boots which extended halfway up his calves and which were trimmed at the tops with rich brown fur completed the impression of barbaric opulence which was suggested by the whole appearance he carried a broad-brimmed hat in his hand while he wore across the upper part of his face extending down the past the cheekbones a black vizard mask which he had apparently adjusted that very moment for his hand was still raised to it as he entered from the lower part of the face he appeared to be a man of strong character with a thick hanging lip and a long straight chin suggestive of resolution pushed to the length of obstinacy you had my note he asked with a deep harsh voice and a strongly marked german accent i told you that i would call he looked from one to the other of us as if uncertain which to address pray take a seat said holmes this is my friend and colleague dr watson who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases whom have i the honor to address you may address me as count von kram a bohemian nobleman i understand that this gentleman your friend is a man of honor and discretion whom i may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance if not i should much prefer to communicate with you alone i rose to go but holmes caught me by the wrist and pushed me back into my chair it is both or none said he you may see before this gentleman anything which you may say to me the count shrugged his broad shoulders then i must begin said he by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years at the end of that time the matter will be of no importance at present it is too much to say that it is of such weight it may have an influence upon european history i promise said holmes and i you may excuse this mask counted our strange visitor the august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you and i may confess at once that the title by which i have just called myself is not exactly my own i was aware of it said holmes dryly the circumstances are of great delicacy and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow to be an immense scandal and seriously compromise one of the ranging families of europe to speak plainly the matter implicates the great house of armstein hereditary kings of bohemia i was also aware of that murmured holmes setting himself down in his armchair closing his eyes our visitor glanced with some apparent surprise at the lugid longing figure of the man who had been no doubt depicted to him as the most insensitive reasoner and most energetic agent in europe holmes slowly reopened his eyes and looked impatiently at his gigantic client if your majesty would condescend to state your case he remarked i should be better able to advise you the man sprang from his chair and paced up and down the room in uncontrollable agitation then with a gesture of desperation he tore the mask from his face and hurled it upon the ground you are right he cried i am the king why should i attempt to conceal it why indeed murmured holmes your majesty had not spoken before i was aware that i was addressing william gottrich sigmund von armstrom 
Grand Duke of Castle Flatsin, and hereditary King of Bohemia. But you can understand, said our strange visitor, sitting down once more and passing his hand over his high white forehead. You can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person, that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have come incognito from Pregu, from the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult, said Holmes, shutting his eyes once more. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, during a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress Irene Adler. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Kindly look her up in my index, doctor, murmured Holmes, without opening his eyes. For many years, he had adopted a system of docking all paragraphs concerning men and things so that it was difficult to name a subject or a person on which he could not at once furnish information. In this case, I found her biography sandwiched in between that of Hebrew rabbi and that of staff commander, who had written a monograph upon the deep-sea fishes. Let me see, said Holmes. Hmm. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Contrita, hmm, let's hmm. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Yes! Retired from the opera stage. Ha! Living in London. Quite so, Your Majesty. As I understand, become entangled with this young person, wrote her some comprising letters and is now desirous of getting these letters back precisely so but how was there a secret marriage none no legal papers or certificates none then i failed to follow your majesty if this young person should produce her letters from blackmailing or other purposes how is she to prove their authenticity there is writing ho hoo forgery my private note paper stolen my own seal imitated my photograph but we were both in the photograph oh dear that is very bad your majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion i was mad insane you have compromised yourself seriously i was only crown prince then i was young i am but thirty now it must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice, burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once, we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice, she had been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it? Absolutely none. Holmes left. It is quite a pretty little problem, said he, but a very serious one to me, returned the king reproachfully. Very indeed. What does she propose to do with the photograph? To ruin me. But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. To Claudia Lorman von Saxe Montenegrin, second daughter of the king of Scandinavia, you may know that strict principles of her family she is herself the very soul of delicacy a shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end and irene adler threatens to send him a photograph and she will do it i know that she will do it you do not know her but she has a soul of steel she has the face of the most beautiful of women and the mind of the most resolute of men rather than i should marry another woman there are no lengths to which she would not go none you are sure that she has not sent it yet i am sure and why because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed that would be next monday oh then we have three days yet said holmes with a yawn that is very fortunate 
as I have one or two matters of importance to look into just at present. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly, you will find me at the Longram under the name of the Count von Kram. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then as to money, you have Corti Blanche. Absolutely. I tell you that I would give one of the provinces of my kingdom to have that photograph. And for the present expenses, the king took a heavy chamos leather bag from under his cloak and laid it on the table. There are three hundred pounds in a gold and seven hundred in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook and handed it to him. And mademoiselle's address, he asked, is Brony Lodge, Supreme Avenue, St. John's Wood. Holmes took a note of it. One other question, said he. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then good night, your majesty, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added, as the wheels of the royal Brogham rolled down the street. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. End of section one. Section 2. At three o'clock precisely, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. I sat down beside the fire, however, with the intention of awaiting him, however long he might be. I was already deeply interested in his inquiry for though it was surrounded by none of the grim and strange features which were associated with the two crimes which i have already recorded still the nature of the case and the exalted station of his client gave it a character of its own indeed apart from the nature of the investigation which my friend had on hand there was something in his masterly grasp of a situation, and his keen, incisive reasoning, which made it a pleasure to me to study his system of work, and to follow the quick, subtle methods by which he distinguished the most inextractable mysteries. So accustomed was I to his invariable success that the very possibility of his felling had ceased to enter into my head. It was close upon four before the door opened, and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kept and side-whiskered, with an inflamed face and disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain that it was indeed he. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, too suited and respectable as of old, putting his hands into his pockets. He stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughing heartily for some minutes. Well, really, he cried, and then he choked and laughed again until he was obliged to lie back, limp and helpless, in the chair. What is it? It's quite too funny. I am sure you could never guess how I employed my morning or what I ended by doing. I can't imagine. I suppose that you have been watching the habits and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler? Quite so, but the sequel was rather unusual. I will tell you, however, I left the house a little after eight o'clock this morning, in the character of a groom, out of work. There is a wonderful sympathy and freemasonry among 
horse him in. But one of them, and you will know all that there is to know, I soon found Brotney Lodge. It is a bazoo villa, with a garden at the back, but built on it front right up to the road, two stories, chub lock to the door. Large sitting room on the right side, well furnished with long windows, almost to the floor, and those prosperous English window fasteners which a child could open. Behind there was nothing remarkable, save the passage window could be reached from the top of the coast hill. I walked round it and examined it closely from every point of view, but without nothing anything else of interest. I then lodged down the street and found as I expected that there was a news in a lane which runs down by one wall of the garden. I want the ostlers a hand in rubbing down their houses, and received in exchange two pence, a glass of half and half, two fills of shag tobacco, and as much information as I could desire about Miss Adler, to say nothing of half a dozen other people in the neighborhood in whom I was not in the least interested, but whose biographies I was compelled to listen to. And what of Irene Adler? I asked. Oh, she has turned all the men's heads down in that part. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on the planet. So say the separatine news to a man. She lives quietly, sings at concerts, drives out at five every day, and returns at seven sharp for dinner. Seldom goes out at other times, except when she sings. Has only one male visitor, but a good deal of him. He is dark, handsome, and dashing. Never calls less than once a day, and often twice. He is Mr. Godfrey Norton of the Inner Temple. See the advantages of a cabman as a confidant? They have driven him home a dozen of times from Serpentine Mews, and knew all about him. When I had listened to all they had to tell, I began to walk up and down near Briny Lodge once more, and to think over my plan of campaign. This gold Fraynor Inn was evidently an important factor in the matter. He was a lawyer. That sounded ominous. What was the relation between them, and what the object of his repeated visits? Was she his client, his friend, or his mistress? If the former, she had probably transferred the photograph to his keeping. If the later, it was less likely on the issue of this question deepened whether I should continue my work at Briny Lodge or turn my attention to the gentleman's chambers in the temple. It was a delicate point, and it winded the field of my inquiry. I fear that I bore you with these details but I have to let you see my little difficulties, if you are to understand the situation. I am following you closely, I answered. I was still balancing the matter in my mind, when a handsome cab drove up to Briny Lodge, and a gentleman sprang out. He was a remarkably handsome man, dark, aquiline, and mustached, evidently the man of whom I have heard. He appeared to be in a great hurry, shouted to the cabman to wait, and brushed past the maid, who opened the door with the air of a man who was thoroughly at home. He was in the house about half an hour, and I could catch glimpses of him in the windows of the sitting room, pacing up and down, talking excitedly and waving his arms. Of her I could see nothing. Presently he emerged, looking even more flurried than before. 
As he stepped up into the cab, he pulled a gold watch from his pocket and looked at it earnestly. Drive like the devil, he shouted, first to Cross and Hungry's in Regret Street, and then to the church of St. Monica in Egua Road. Half a guinea if you do it in twenty minutes. Away they went, and I was just wondering whether I should not do well to follow them, when up the lane came a neat little landau. The coachman, with his coat only half buttoned, and his tie under his ear, while all the tags of his harness were sticking out of the buckles. It hadn't pulled up before she shot out of the hall door and into it. I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman, with a face that a man might die for. The Church of St. Monica, John, she cried, and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. This was quite too good to lose, Watson. I was just balancing whether I should run for it, or whether I should perch behind her landau, when a cab came through the street. The driver looked twice at such a shabby fare, but I jumped in before he could object. The Church of St. Monica, said I, and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. It was twenty-five minutes to twelve, and of course it was clear enough what was in the wind. My cabby drove 